Hi everyone, I'm Perry. Welcome to Living Your Best Life with Eddie Stone, founder and CEO of Touchstone Essential. Hello, Eddie. Hello, Perry. Nice to be with you today and uh, happy to have a chance to talk with your audience. Uh -huh. How's everything over there, Eddie? You know what? We're, we're doing good here. For those of that have been tracking, my arm is out of its cast now and it's into a brace. And so we're, we're getting better and getting back on track. Uh -huh. Okay, so we start now with the question, all right? Sure. Okay. From Infinity Twin, could you tell me what the initial symptoms of healing are with starting zeolite? I did a heavy metal detox prior to zeolite, but when I took zeolite, I got a bladder infection on day two. I'm assume, assuming from concentrated heavy metals in urine, also thrush things coming up in skin, small lumps not itchy forms a crust and heals. Is that nano or heavy metal coming out? Urine looked like Coca-Cola. Is that normal? And smells so offensive on day one and bowels perching for several days. A little more. <laughs> I'm taking this. Yeah. This is normal cathartic reaction to detoxing. I was just surprised because I've been detoxing, cleansing with a natural path since April 2018. To discover another layer of toxic toxins, I was surprised. I'm recovering from autoimmunity and thyroid fatigue, so my body is still very sensitive. Well, that's a pretty dramatic uh, right. story there relative to the detox. Uh, so the zeolite, assuming she, she's talking about just using the zeolite, not greens or anything, is a passive detox. And so, you know, Quite literally, I think I've said it on the show before, um, it basically attracts to itself, kind of like a magnet does, the heavy metals, volatile organics, things with a positive charge, and then takes them out of the body. It's not reactionary. You know, sometimes when you think of like an herbal cleanse, you know, that can, can be a reactionary uh, type of cleanse. Certain colonics people use can be reactionary types of cleanses, and so you would more think of symptoms, uh, maybe not quite as dramatic as described, but you would think of symptoms in this way. And so to be candid, I don't hear of symptoms like this at all. Um, in fact, I don't know that I ever recall in the decade plus that I've worked with zeolites, something of this kind. And so I just wonder, and I'm purely just speculating, if there's not other things going on, particularly as it relates to uh, the bladder infection and the sores and things being described. But clearly, if they feel like from the start of it, the symptoms through use of it, it's getting better than, you know, something's coming out of the body in a positive way, whatever is causing that to occur. But if, if I would suggest that if they have these symptoms persist, number one, they stop anything they were doing that they think could be associated with, with the creation or the start of the symptoms. So might be a change in diet, a change in exercise habits, use of, of zeolite, whatever happens to be. And if they persist, really seek out the advice of a um, nice, solid, credentialed uh, medical professional. They may need some blood work or some other things to really figure out what's going on there because that's a pretty dramatic reaction and they really want to investigate that in sort of all, all possible ways. Mm -hmm. Okay, so another one from Albo. What would be the best home remedy for its vitamin D, meaning exposed to the sun or green, as a lot of nano uh, material in them? Well, one of the things that we're conscious of, and I'm going to actually, as we get into the show, I'm going to speak on this subject a little more, uh, is making sure that our sourcing comes from uh, certified organic farms. And that's because uh, these are farming environments where the soil is tested for uh, purity. You know, we're looking for soil that's not only free of pesticides, herbicides, um, toxins, but also has live um, microorganisms in it, which is really sort of where healthy greens and other fruits and vegetables come from. The health of the soil makes a real big impact along with the type of seed that's used, and we want to use heirloom seed. And so we know that the greens we're using, for example, are free of pesticides and herbicides and fungicides and heavy metals. These things are, are tested for. It's a part of our protocol and our process. And you can have some confidence when you're buying it. It says USD organic 
um, on on the label. I know I know for me as a consumer and my family, that's one of the things that we uh, pay attention to. In terms of home remedies for vitamin D, really that's a challenge because I don't know beyond um, getting sun to the trunk, right? The face is unlikely to provide enough of a vitamin D production stimulation. But if you have a, a torso that you haven't had too much sun on, it's not uh, it's, the skin is in a good, healthy condition. You should be able to, if a person takes their shirt off, uh, to get sun with proper exposure um, uh, to create or stimulate the production of vitamin D. But I go back to uh, buying organic and using good, uh, clean, healthy greens, whether you're taking it as a supplement or if you're buying it and preparing it at home or making your own smoothies, whatever it happens to be, that's really going to be the best option for most people because the sun exposure is sort of challenging to create. Beyond that, I don't know what other advice to give in that regard because D is, is a, a little bit of a challenge. So I don't know what else I would say in terms of home remedy. Uh -huh. Okay, and today what do you want to share with us, Eddie? Well, I, I have a couple of things and I, I, I think they all sort of tie together, but I need everybody to sort of uh, walk this path with me here because it's, uh, it, 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 it's, you know, we've got several things we want to sort of speak of. And the first one is, um, really, my heart goes out to the folks in the Marian Islands that just saw, I think, the uh, most catastrophic and most intense uh, typhoon uh, yesterday or in the last 24 hours to hit that island. And I guess there's several of those islands that uh, they aren't even able to be in contact with because they've lost all communication and electricity. And it just sort of reminds me of these incredibly strong storms we seem to have a surge of over the past uh, few months. It's been a very intense uh, storm season. And so in the U.S., you know, we've dealt with Flo and we've dealt with Michael and, of course, uh, through the Philippines and Japan and probably even the uh, lower parts of, of Thailand, you've seen some of these typhoons and things that have come through. And whenever you see this kind of weather event, and, and so here we're talking about typhoons and hurricanes, but in the U.S., we deal with um, other kinds of weather events, and that's uh, principally we talk about uh, when we're dealing with droughts. Um, and in the western part of the United States, we've had a, a pretty long run, California, Nevada, um, Oregon, large parts of the country uh, that have been dry for a long period of time. Now, some of those regions are desert regions, and so they're accustomed to dealing with the dry uh, but it does seem for the past decade or so we've dealt with it more. And so one of the things it creates there is an environment where wildfires become uh, more prominent and literally millions of acres burn, particularly in the late spring and the summer and throughout the fall uh, here in the United States and other uh, parts of the world. I mean, it's so much so that we have to have an entire fire brigades that do nothing but really deal with wildfires and, and they're quite heroic individuals that go in and, uh, and uh, deal with those things. But invariably, you've got people that lose their lives uh, in the actual fire. You've got communities where the houses will, will burn. And one of the things that we tend not to think of is the ancillary impact beyond just seeing the physical damage to a structure or a community. Because um, when wildfires rage, uh, there's all kinds of chemicals that are being polluted and put into the air with the smoke, particularly if you're talking about a fire that consumes a home. And we think about all the plastics and the paints and the other materials that you find in a home. Well, those particulates that are burning, they get into the atmosphere, the wind blows them, not just in that community, but quite literally uh, across the country. We know that when there are uh, major weather events in China, for example, uh, we'll actually see the impact of that in, in the in the sandstorms and, and other types of storms that actually get into the atmosphere in Japan, go across the Pacific into the United States, into Canada. And so really, while we may see something sort of across the country, we all can be impacted because of the particulates. They're so small, um, they get into the jet stream and they really travel around the world. And so here's here's some of the impacts that happen there. Uh, one is um, it creates an inflammatory response. And we know that a lot of disease uh, really begins when the body is dealing with inflammation. We know that chronic inflammation 
Uh, we commonly think of it being associated with cardiovascular disease, but it also impacts the function of the body, managing glucose and, and other issues that ultimately can lead to uh, increased risk for type 2 diabetes. And so inflammation is a problem because then it also can impact our risk for cancer. And of course, these smokes, we, 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 we probably commonly recognize that they can uh, create issues with asthma. And if you're, if you're a person with sort of uh, diminished function of lungs, uh, perhaps an elderly person, we certainly see this in China where elderly people that are dealing with smog and smoke either from industrial complexes or from fire, you have increased issues with asthma, uh, young kids as well. And so you want to avoid these things because they create long-term uh, damage uh, to the lungs, you know, and sometimes you can't uh, recover. Uh, and that's not even to, you know, really get into the, the, the deep dive on, on the cancer and the heart attack and the other things. And so one of the things that I, you know, and everybody that's, that's watched our show, you know, I'm, I'm a real advocate of paying attention to, you know, what you eat, but you also need to pay attention to your atmosphere. And so if you are in an area where you're dealing with um, smoke from wildfire or just industrial, you know, pollution, you want to think about your home and you want to do what you can to protect your home. Now, homes need ventilation, but in times of wildfire or whatever, you might need to seal off your home, not literally, but you know, doors shut, windows shut, and you're relying on the internal um, heating and air conditioning system for circulation. And, and all that is to say, make sure you're using filters. You know, every home, whether it's an independent unit that sits in a room or it's a filtration unit that's a part of the uh, heating and air conditioning system, people need to use filters and they need to change them frequently. And if you find yourself in a situation such as a community where you've dealt with wildfire or a home has burned in your area for other reasons, when you're involved with cleanup, you want to pay attention to using a respiratory mask. Now, most of the time, these are easily available at hardware stores or other places where supplies are sold for, for caring for your home. But you want to be conscious of that because we speak so often on this show about the foods that we eat and exposures in that way. Well, you can become polluted with heavy metals, volatile organics, environmental pollutants from things going on externally as it relates to fire or issues that come up when we see these super storms blow through areas. Then it gets into the water supply. We spoke about that a couple of weeks ago. And so I just feel like it's important for us to continue to bring attention to this so that people can pay attention to what's happening in this regard because it's so easy to uh, maybe not smell it consciously uh, you don't see it, and so you ignore the issue or you don't think about its impact to you. Or if you're in an area where there's a lot of smog or wildfire smoke, you may get used to it. So then you don't notice it. That, that doesn't mean just because you're used to it uh, that it's not creating acute issues for your health related to all these things we've spoken of from lung disease, heart attacks, cancer risk. So that's sort of the first part of this. And so externally being conscious of air quality that you and your family have available to you, water quality. These are, these are things that are crucial and they're sort of the outside concerns we should have. But now let's talk about the inside concerns in terms of what you consume. And the reason I wanted to bring this up is there was an interesting story <clears throat> published yesterday. Uh, most major uh, news organizations have this. So whether it's the BBC, uh, CNN, or any, any others, uh, you'll be able to find access to this. But they published a, a study in JAMA, which is a well-recognized, peer-reviewed journal uh, of internal medicine here uh, in the United States, but recognized globally, about the impact of organic foods, the consumption of organic foods. So basically, a consumer, a family, choosing to eat organic as much as they can and its impact on their risk of cancer. Mm. And this was a really... It's a, it's a good solid story where, or, or, or I should say study, where they're actually following people for a four plus year period of time. So we're talking about a large, lengthy, longitudinal study uh, looking at culture and behavior, which is really one of the better ways for us to think about developing health habits. And so you're talking about people that even if they made only a modest investment, right? So not every meal was organic, but even making a modest investment in trying to eat clean and eat organic, 
uh, had a positive impact in terms of reducing their risk of cancer. Some cancers, for those that ate organic, were reduced by 75%, some types of cancer, and overall a general 25%. Now, when you dive into the numbers, it varies a little bit uh, depending on which type of cancer you're discussing, but the bottom line is a very strong indicator for us buying foods for our house, for our kids, for our children, for our family. We prepare meals coming up like Thanksgiving, you know, paying attention to organic because when you buy organic, you give yourself a better chance to avoid some of these toxins, neurotoxins particularly, that we would associate with uh, pesticides, fungicides, herbicides. Then you can get into situations where that organic, likely the practices of the farming groups involved with producing the organic fruits and vegetables are better for the environment just in terms of it's cleaner, the runoff into the water supply. I mean, there's sort of this cascade effect that's very positive in that regard. They often will use heirloom seeds that have a little more dense, rich nutrition. It's particularly true in, in, in grains. And so it's important to think about that when you consider, you know, the dynamics of the exposures to the environment, which may be less, you're less able to control, but you certainly can control it in terms of the purchasing of organic fruits and vegetables. And then an area here that I'll mention as we have Halloween coming up, and I know that Halloween isn't necessarily celebrated all throughout the world, but certainly in the U.S., parts of Europe, a few parts of Asia, I've actually been in uh, Tokyo during Halloween before. I know there's a lot of people in, in Japan that pay attention to and have fun with Halloween. And so Halloween is great, right? But one of the hallmarks of it is the kids get a lot of candy, right? That's sort of one of the big functions here. But candy uh, can give you exposure to not just a lot of sugar. We'll set that conversation aside for the moment. I don't want to be a party pooper. Sometimes, you know, kids like to have sugar. The candies are really quite horrible in their use of food dyes. And in fact, we've just uh, published a, a, a blog post uh, about this subject because I don't think people quite realize the uh, impact food dyes can have in terms of the body and, and how they impact your DNA and other things. And so there's, there's you know, blue number one, right? Which is kind of this brilliant blue. And then there's num blue number two, right? That's often what you see on the label, indigo blue. You get green three, uh, that's often referred to as fast green. You've got red number three, red, red 40, yellow five, yellow six, which is sunset. And all of these are chemicals that are, our bodies just aren't built to manage. And you would be surprised at the volume that you wind up consuming, particularly in processed foods, candies, and sweets. And the bottom line is um, nobody's advocating or really fighting this for consumers uh, because we're sort of overwhelmed by the money spent by big food, just like big pharma and big tobacco in the past. You know, they have all the sort of financial resources to, you know, push their agenda and allow these things, which really have no business being in our food supply, uh, to be in our food supply. It's just coloring. It has zero nutritional value. It's just there to make something look pretty or match an image on a commercial or an advertisement in print magazine for the type of candy that you're purchasing. And so these are things that don't have any real value for us. But if you're a marketer of foods, then you would do that. And so I encourage people just we talk about fruits and vegetables, you know, go back to paying attention to organic greens in the beginning. You can buy foods that are colored, and it will say it on the label, with things like carrots, uh, whether that's yellow or orange carrots for coloring. Uh, grape, uh, grape skins and grape skin extracts can provide coloring. Uh, paprika, that's very common. Saffron, love saffron, right? Nice yellow. You got turmeric, which will give you a bright yellow and, and sort of a gold color. And even vegetable juices are used. Um, next week, I'll be traveling, not next week, two weeks from now, I'll be traveling to Las Vegas to a convention uh, uh, for food suppliers. And, you know, one of the things we're seeing more prominently is the use of natural colors and food. People want pretty food, fair enough, but let's use something that makes sense. But all too often in the packaged food world where it's just all about a race to the bottom in terms of cost, we don't see this. And so, you know, paying attention to this study that was published, I encourage everybody to go online and, and take a look at it. Um, you know, we're bombarded by things from the outside, from these storms, from these... Uh, wildfires. I mean, it, it sort of comes at us in all 
always, right? It can almost be overwhelming trying to manage the issues. Pay attention and make a difference where you can. So buying organic is a big deal. Trying to buy things that aren't loaded with artificial food colors. All of these things will improve not just your immediate health outcome, but your long-term health outcome. And you'll be providing a better environment for your family and those you love and care about. So that's what I wanted to mention today. Just bring some additional awareness, right, of living a healthy life and, you know, paying attention to what we're putting in our body, whether we're talking about food dyes or the outside environment, what's getting into our home. It's not easy, you know, Eddie, like when, when we want to buy something, buy food, you know, like we have to know what we are eating, right? But in everything. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it, it is. And I really feel for this. I mean, I'm in this business, right? And so I'm pretty hypersensitive to it. And I know that most people, they get up really early and take care of their family business and they go to work and they come home and they take care of family business. And man, their day doesn't have a lot of room to overthink about these things. And most people don't just work one day a week or five days a week. They work six days a week and sometimes seven days a week. And so it's hard to find the time to focus on health. And then there's managing budgets. I know people are looking for the least expensive food they can that still provides, um, you know, satisfies hunger and, and nourishment for their family. So it, it does mean you've got to dive a little deeper and not just accept things at face value. Read labels. I, I really, you want to live a longer life. You want to reduce your risk of cancer. Just like this organic study that I mentioned, learn to read labels and just just like the study said, even people that were not able to eat everything organic, they only ate a little bit organic, they still reduced their risk of cancer. So any step you can take to eat less processed food, less ultra processed food, less foods that are colored by dyes, um, just like controlling the air in your home, all of these things, it, it, it adds up, right? And so it's, it's, worth, it's worth the effort, right? You're, you're, you're individually, the people listening to us and watching us, you're you're worth the effort. Make the effort for yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, Eddie, go back to Wi-Fi. Okay, here we don't have the same problem, but most of the time, Thai people, I mean, what they do after agriculture, they burn, you know, after harvesting. So we have smoke too, you know. So they should, what, detox their body? After that? Oh, absolutely. For people that are exposed to smoke, whether that is from burning crops in the field. I remember a few years ago being in Hawaii and watching them burn off uh, the remnants of a uh, pineapple harvest, uh, or I should say, excuse me, sugarcane uh, harvest, and uh, just the thick billowing uh, smoke in the air, right? And so, I mean, if you can smell it, you know, it's getting into your body. And so, if you're exposed to things like that, you, you, you need to detox, um, whether that's extra amounts of good, clean water, and getting some greens in your life, in your diet, or even using something like our Pure Body, Pure Body Extra. I'm a huge believer in the value of that being a, a day in and day out daily supplement, just like the other supplements we use. Um, big advocate of that. I've never found a more effective systemic way to detox. But if that isn't something that makes sense for you, then thinking about increasing the amount of water you consume, clean water you consume, and increasing the amount of greens in your diet, those are things that will also have an impact, not as much, uh, but they'll have a positive impact. But how long do they have to detox? Because they do that every year to burn their crops, you know, after harvesting. I don't think of detox as a period, right? I'm not, I don't think of it in terms of, I'm gonna detox for 30 days, 90 days, six months. I think of it as a part of my health routine, just like I tried to exercise on a, as a lifestyle. Um, maybe sometimes that's just walking with the dog and, and my family. And maybe sometimes it's actually going to the gym, but I don't say I'm going to exercise for 30 days or 90 days. It's an ongoing part of my routine and my health habits, just like the consumption of water, limitation of sweets, um, no fast food, ultra processed foods, things like that. I think of detox as the same ongoing part of my exercise. So just like I'm trying to get nutrients into my life, on a daily basis, I'm, I'm also paying attention daily to detox. I don't think you can think of it as a temporary short period of time. I think it's ongoing. But same thing, Eddie, like uh, when we say we work out too much, it's no good, right? And like uh, any detox, like keep going like this, is it okay? Well, zeal, so two things. Um, one, greens, right, which we talk a lot about, and most people don't eat a lot of greens, right? They're not big into the flavor. 
Um, those are things that encourage and aid the body passively to get rid of toxins, right? So it's not a stimulus in that regard. I do have concerns about things such as herbal cleanses that actually create a stimulation, right? Your, your bowel movement increases or is more aggressive, something along those lines. There's teas that people use uh, that create a colon cleanse, but you, you don't want to do things like that on a, a regular basis because the, the body would make adjustments to that, increase stimulation in the uh, contractions taking place in the bowel, and, and then all of a sudden you, you can't do it on your own, right? You got to take the tea to actually, to actually do it. So people find themselves in difficult situations. They can't go to the bathroom without the teas, right? They don't want to do that. So I think of this in, in regards to things that are passive. And so the zeolite, um, fresh fruits and vegetables, greens, those are passive ways to help detox and, and, and cleanse the body. And so in that regard, I don't know of any reason why there would be a negative associated for the ongoing use. Uh, that would tend to be things that are stimulating in that regard, and that's not true of the zeolite. Uh -huh. Okay, thank you very much, Eddie, for good information. We see thank you, you Perry. Week, okay. Next week, thank you. Bye Have now. Have a good day. Bye. Bye-bye.